So when you're trying to, we'll, we'll go with the, the USB devices first. When you're trying to reverse mm -hmm. engineer one of these protocols, like what is the process you actually go through? Well, so the first step would be, well, I guess the video I just recently did, a series of videos on the ROG Ally, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because that one I didn't really know for sure what it was going to be. Like, okay, if it's a, a mouse, you know, the only interface it has to the PC is USB. Right. It's pretty obvious it's going to be USB and likely going to be uh, HID as well, because it's mm -hmm. a mouse. Are things different but... if it's a Bluetooth mouse? uh yes okay bluetooth supports hid but we don't support very many bluetooth devices in fact i think the only bluetooth device we do support is like the ps4 controller which has rgb um oh it does doesn't it yeah it does that like usually it just uses to show what player it is but that's right, just right. an rgb led um but for the most part we don't support bluetooth devices mm -hmm. um there's nothing saying we can't. It's just that reverse engineering them isn't as easy. And then a lot of Bluetooth devices don't actually expose their full control set over Bluetooth. Like, I know I have some Bluetooth, at, well, like dual mode keyboards that can work Bluetooth or wired. Mm -hmm. And they expose their full control set over wired, but they're only a basic keyboard over Bluetooth. Ah, uh, so, okay. So I, I know there are some devices like that where the Bluetooth capabilities are limited. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just the primary functionality but yeah but there's nothing saying you couldn't because mm -hmm. hid works over bluetooth as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um i derailed you there what oh you were talking about the uh reverse engineering process yeah yeah so the idea would be first to figure out what interface it is so we went over the different interfaces mm -hmm. so that's probably going to be obvious by what type of device it is but whenever you're dealing with like something that's RGB built into a system, whether it's a motherboard, a laptop, a uh, handheld, then you know it could be I squared C, it could be um, it could be USB, it could be. I know there's some weird ASUS laptops that use like WMI for it, okay. and I think WMI is like a like a low level BIOS thing, and I, I'm not sure if it's actually a hardware interface or not. But that's how we figured out how to talk to it is by calling it ACPI or a WMI function. Uh, Windows uh, so also has sure. a thing called WMI. I cannot find the one yeah. you're looking for. Uh, it is that. It's oh, like Windows, Windows Management. Windows in management. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's like WMI methods that you call to control the RGB on some laptop. Mm -hmm. um, and then some older MSI boards use like the Super IO directly for RGB because. They only do like single RGB, like just analog um, 12 volt RGB. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they just have like three PWM channels in the super IO that you just talk to directly and output three voltages onto three pins. Um, so you figure it out by kind of, well, first of all, you look at the USB device list and see if there's any USB device on the system that could be a, an RGB controller. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If there are no, uh, RG if there are no USB devices that could be an RGB controller, then you kind of have to dig into, there's like different tools that you can use. I, I think there's like a process monitor or process explorer or something like that, mm -hmm. that it shows like all the different calls to DLL files and windows and you can break point on them. And so if you find like it's writing to some hardware register or calling some DLL that, access is hardware mm -hmm. uh, you can break point on that and try and figure out what's being passed in i think that's how they how that person figured out uh, nvme for the ssd mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's how we originally figured out like nvidia graphics cards was, was calling into nv api um but the f you would always want to start with usb i think because usb is going to be probably the most likely mm -hmm. and the easiest to reverse engineer because wireshark can capture that Mm, so. okay so that's what i did on the ally was it looked like the controller the rgb was part of like the built-in game controller that it had right. and that was like a usb peripheral connected to the motherboard internally and um so i figured out pretty quickly that it had an asus vendor id usb device and then uh that was the cue to try and capture data from that and see mm -hmm. what it was doing 
Mm. So. And then it's it's a sort of a matter of decoding what that data is. Yeah, so so basically it, you just start looking at streams of bytes and you don't know what any of them mean. So what I always try to do is I try and set like a known value, like red is going to be FF0000 right, uh, right. in hex. And then you go and you look through the bytes and you try and look for zeros and FFs and see if you find them. Mm -hmm. And then if you do find a packet, usually like the first few bytes are going to be some kind of ID that tells it like which packet is, what the command is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then I go and I change it to green or something and that shifts from FF0000 to OOFF00. And then mm -hmm. I go and I look for the same packet and see, okay, did the FF move to this other position? And then once I find where that transition is, then I write down, okay, this is the structure of that packet. And then try to figure out which byte is red, which byte is green, which byte is blue. And then like any potential modes and parameters that you can adjust in the software, just tweak those parameters, go look at the data, see what changed. So it's basically just make a change, look for a change, and then try and figure out how to connect the two. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. If you're dealing with an I2C device, how does that process change? That changes a lot. So okay. Wireshark doesn't capture I2C. Mm -hmm. um, so because of the way Windows accesses I2C by just poking at low-level control registers, mm -hmm. we can take advantage of that. And basically, we wrote a tool called I, I wrote a tool called I squared C sniffer, and what it does is it just continuously reads the I squared C register over and over again, uh -huh. and then you run the other program that tries to write to it, and hopefully you read it fast enough that you can catch the value that was put in and read it out before the hardware changes it to a new value, uh -huh. and you just probe it so fast that you can basically just decode what was being put in to that register and then basically uh, capture that data and then log it to a file of like which bytes were written and like uh, word lengths and all that. That's, that sounds like a hack. It is a huge hack, but it actually most of the time works. And because every application writes to the registers in its own way at its own timing and its mm -hmm. own everything, it doesn't work consistently or for everything. Mm -hmm. It works differently on AMD versus Intel because the registers are different. Right. And then some programs it doesn't seem to capture and some programs it does. So mm -hmm. it's not reliable, but it's reliable enough that we've gotten some good use out of it. Mm -hmm. And if you can't with that, then you either... Uh, a lot of I2C devices are sort of treated like just a block of memory. Okay. So they have their own like internal registers so if you set ff0000 for like red for instance mm -hmm. then you can go do a command on linux there's a command called i squared c dump and that will read those registers out from a device right and so you can like set read set read and then look for changes that way mm -hmm. but some devices use more like a packet structure i squared c command where it's not just writing to memory it's sending a packet and that packet's not stored anywhere Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and those are harder to de diagnose or debug because they don't, you can't just read the memory back and see the packets being written. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work, then you have to go the hardware route. That's when you break out the oscilloscope or the logic analyzer, find the I squared C pin on your motherboard and try and poke it or solder a wire to it or something like that to uh, debug it. I have soldered wires to motherboards before. Uh -huh. for um that kind of purpose so <laughs> i'm sure that's always uh always want to avoid that as much as possible yes that's the uh that's the nuclear option you don't want to do that but sometimes they leave you no choice mm -hmm. i have i never actually did it but i was planning on because the i squared c is a bus so all the ram slots are all kind of wired to the same i squared c interface mm -hmm. i was planning on taking one stick of uh ram and soldering like the the lines to that stick of RAM, and then you could just plug that RAM module in, and you'd have a probing interface there without having to hook up to the board. Uh -huh. But sometimes the RAM and then the on but on board I squared C are on two different interfaces, so that wouldn't always work, but mm -hmm. it could help you in some circumstances. So, 
yeah. whenever I talk to people about reverse engineering, it always just it it always <laughs> starts at like something you know something kind of nice and just devolves into yeah you know <laughs> just make yeah. it work somehow. <laughs> yeah, it's it can be quite a process to reverse engineer, and that's just kind of the idea was you know I want to it's it's just a puzzle you just look at it and you go okay here's the thing obviously it it somehow communication gets from point A to point B, okay, now what is that communication? How does it work? And what are the tools that I have at my disposal to figure that out? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's just, it's a puzzle. That's how it was, at least in the beginning when we had no idea how it worked. It was like, okay, well, we, we're talking to RAM. What interfaces could it possibly use? Mm -hmm. So you look at the pinout of the RAM slot and you go, okay, it's got a memory bus and it's got I squared C and it's got some power. So it has to be one of those two. It's probably the I squared C. I mean, my first test setup was I literally took the back panel off of my computer and there was a hole cut in the case behind the uh, the RAM slots. Uh -huh. And then I took like a, I put a helping, like those helping hands you use for soldering. Uh -huh. I clipped an oscilloscope probe into one of those. I put it on top of a box and then I just nudged it forward until it was poking the right pin on the back of the board. Uh -huh. And then hooked it up to the scope and looked at it while I was changing the RGB commands. Mm -hmm. It worked. It it got me the data, and somehow I didn't short out my RAM slot doing it. So, ha <laughs> have you ever done? Uh, have you ever killed any uh, hardware trying to mess around like this? Actually, no. Surprisingly, wow. not. No. I I've, I've bricked read. some things, but I haven't like permanently damaged hardware. So. Well, look, if and you had documentation, that you wouldn't have to, to do this. <laughs> right. Yes, that's the ultimate goal. Is, uh, reverse engineering can be interesting, mm -hmm. but it shouldn't be necessary.